The use of data is important, but data itself is not the shiny object. It's an enabler to have a better, more efficient conversation that's better for advertisers and that's better for consumers. Once that's the standard, we're now at a point where literally every video impression is addressable. Hey, it's E.B. Moss, and this is a three-way conversation today for episode 40. I can't believe it. 40. Yay. Insider insights from Media Village. I head up content strategy. I don't head up research. So I brought along the experts who do. Today, I brought Jeff Minsky with me. Hey, Jeff. Hey, Abby. You are the lead analyst and editor of the Myers Report. Describe the Myers Report. The Myers Report is the gold standard in research about advertising and marketing and media and the attitudes of agencies towards the media community and the media community towards agencies. It's all that and a bag of chips. And before you joined the Myers Report, which is part of Myers BizNet, which also has Media Village, etc., you were at Omnicom Media Group. And there, I think you were the head of Emerging Media Investments. Is that right? That is correct. It included advanced television. It included digital signage, gaming, mobile uh, investment as well. But a lot of time was spent in the advanced TV area. So that's why you are our wonk for the Myers Report. And we brought, I hope that's an okay word to use for you, Jonathan Stoyer. I love the word wonk. (laughs) Okay, good. Good. Because you are one of the preeminent ones in the industry. Jonathan actually is at Omnicom Media Group, and you manage media, consumer research capabilities, the primary research, investment research, syndicated tools. I'm just going to let you explain it because it's pretty impressive. It's kind of a laundry list. I came in as the research guy, coming from having been the research guy at a couple of advanced TV product companies at TiVo, and then before that in what evolved into AT&T AdWorks, and had applied my research skills to looking at very granular TV data that mostly has has been and now is being used even more to do more advanced targeting and much more granular measurement of not only how people are watching TV and how that fits into the rest of the, the media ecosystem. And so starting out as the research guy, I sort of rebuilt that practice following uh, Jeff's departure in inside OMG and now have a whole separate team that's focused on deploying advanced TV tools through our Omni platform out to the rest of Omnicom. I love it. So if you need us to repeat that, listening audience, we're going to dive into what a lot of that means, projections for the future, with the chief research officer for Omnicom Media Group and the lead analyst and editor of the Myers Report. So let's get some insights. I'm E.B. Moss for Media Village which drives the business of media, marketing, and advertising forward through content by, for, and about thought leaders in ad tech and ad agencies, the audio space, and addressability, even those who are advancing diversity. So let's get some insights. Okay, so Jonathan, you described a little bit of your role in the introduction to episode 40. What's going on at Omnicom and what's going on that is informing some of the new tools that you're creating and what are they? Well, I think what's going on at Omnicom and what's going on in the broader media ecosystem is what in some other conversation like this I described as a convergence of convergence because there was all this talk for, as Jeff remembers, 20 plus years about when's convergence going to happen in the media ecosystem? And then all of a sudden, it was the thing that kind of had already happened. And we were looking at it in the rearview mirror and trying to figure out how to tie all the pieces of the cross-platform media world together. And in the world of television specifically, that has been about the shift from broadcast TV and live viewing to DVRs, like I dealt with in my TiVo days, to now pretty much a full on-demand media ecosystem where consumers can get whatever media they want on whatever device they want it, and increasingly with a flexibility around the business model they're able to use to get to that. Reaching consumers in that world 
for advertisers has become harder than ever Mm -hmm. because the targeting tools that have evolved in search and in social media and for display advertising have never really fully carried over into the world of TV and broadcast media. But as all the ad impressions in the world are becoming technically addressable, so are becoming targetable on a one-to-one basis rather than on a broadcast basis, it's now forcing the entire media ecosystem to shift how it thinks about targeting and measurement in order to be able to carry on the kinds of conversations advertisers want to have with consumers. Jeff, you have the advantage of now looking at the ecosystem across all platforms for the Myers Report and Myers BizNet, previously working on the agency side as Jonathan does now. What would you add to his observations about the marketplace? And then I'm going to cut you guys loose to discuss, as they say. Well, I, you know, as, as Jonathan said, we, we have been hoping for the holy grail for 20 years now or, or more. And it is incredibly interesting to see the advancements that have occurred in particular over the past five years since I left Omnicom or past four years since I left Omnicom. But there are, there is no clear path. And that's the, what keeps it interesting, keeps it challenging. And I think we'll, we'll delve into a little bit in our discussion today. But there is definitely advancement. And obviously, as we've seen in the marketplace, the the value of the data to the advertising industry has never been more pronounced than it is now, whether that is rightfully or accurately valued or not. It is still the perception of that is incredibly high at the moment and is top of mind with marketers uh, across the board. Everybody wants, especially especially as we move into a world where the paid ad pool continues to shrink, you have to get smarter with how you use your paid advertising. And I think that is going to be something that, that we'll, uh, we'll, we'll delve into a little bit. And I, I mean, I think just to build on that, the, the use of data is important, but data itself is not the shiny object. It's an enabler to have a better, more efficient conversation that's better for advertisers and that's better for consumers. And for consumers, ultimately, and you just mentioned this, we're already on a path to lower ad loads. And that's because consumers aren't willing to tolerate the levels of ad load that they had previously, especially in broadcast television, but in other places as well. The trick is if we can cleverly use data to have fewer, more valuable impressions, then we have conversations that are better for everybody and that still provide enough revenue to subsidize consumers' media experiences. Well, and and since we've delved, gone and delved into the data topic at this point, you know, there have been recent acquisitions of data companies for billions of dollars, and Omnicom has not gone that route. Can you give us a little bit of your thoughts on the benefit of not acquiring a data company like an Axiom or an Epsilon and how Omnicom views that as actually a benefit? I think that that's part of the story of how we're approaching Omni and how we're, which is our people-based marketing framework to market. I think Omnicom's belief, A, is typically that it's better to build things organically than to buy them when that's feasible. And B, that identity and the link between actual humans and their personal data and their activity and how that gets used in a targeting and measurement ecosystem is something that I think we believe isn't something your agency should be bringing to you. The right solution to that problem is different for every client and every advertising vertical and every product category. And so I think our belief was to build a framework that would support our clients to bring their own data to bring their own point of view about identity and matching and what level of targeting and measurement they were interested in connecting back to person's level data and to have an open tool set in which they could do that with whoever the provider or providers of first or third party data or identity they were interested in working with. So can you give us a little bit of a top level kind of process of how the agency internal agency people are using the Omni platform. Who is it built for? Is it built for just the media people? Is it built for just the buyers? How does the Omni platform actually work? The notion of Omni, I think, and and it's as much a framework as it is a platform in that 
it connects a bunch of tools together with an underlying identity framework that is compatible with all of the identity solutions in the marketplace. And the idea is to be able to use that to have a person level or a household level conversation throughout the entire advertising process, the entire consumer journey. And that begins with tools that let us see signals about what consumers are doing in the in the marketplace, whether that's web behavior, or location data, or, or first party data that's coming directly from our, our advertisers, using that to define both the creative focus that they should have. There are some content inspiration tools in there that tell us if you're interested in talking to people like this, here are the kinds of content that resonate with them. Using that in our creative agencies and throughout Omnicom group, not just Omnicom Media Group, to inform the creative process and then to use that holistically through the targeting and measurement of media as it goes out into the media ecosystem. And how have the, I mean, I'm not sure how much of an insight you have into the creative agencies, but have they embraced this? Is this something that they that they have, that they feel is a big benefit? I think it's early days, but what we've found is so many of our big client relationships now involve explicit collaborations between an OMC creative agency and a media agency that that's where we're getting sort of the initial pull. So, you know, groups like Nissan and McDonald's and now the U.S. Army, all of whom have sort of a bespoke constellation of, you know, a combination of one of the creative agencies and the media agencies see the benefit immediately. And, you know, we're evolving the tools on the creative side. But I think everybody gets that having a common framework to connect all of our our creative and planning and buying and measurement and reporting and optimization tools together is better than trying to go out and smash together 27 different vendor solutions without that connective framework, but also taking into account that there has to be flexibility because the right tool for one industry might not be the same as for another and the right data set for one industry might not be the same as for another. So the focus has been on open and connected rather than, you know, a unified platform that's a, that we think is a single solution that will be right for everybody. And, and it sounds like this is a, a, a good platform to break down what is always generally perceived within large holding companies or large agencies as a siloed world. It sort of brings everybody together on the same communication chain. That's exactly right. It's a mechanism to provide a common footing that everyone throughout the the creative and media delivery and optimization process can take advantage of. So getting back to the, to the data part of it for a second, because you, you've mentioned that it's a people-based data. Can you explain to myself and our listeners, what, what do you mean by people-based data? The idea is to start with humans and their behavior, whether that is looking at data signals that people have explicitly made available to marketers because they you know, use the uh, the McDonald's app to order their food, which McDonald's wants to use to help do a better job of, of serving them as customers, or whether it's visiting websites that are, are related, you know, fairly common data signals that are used out in the marketplace, using those to shape target audiences, typically on an aggregate level. So to get an understanding of how do those customers behave, what motivates them, what drives them, you know, try to develop a sense of empathy with them and to understand where, what they care about and where they want to go. And then to use other data signals about, you know, so, for example, media consumption data that's coming from TV viewership, set-top boxes, or, or smart TVs, to say, okay, where are the people interested in those things showing up on TV so we can talk to the people who care the most about what we're doing? And then to ultimately tie that back together to... Did those ads resonate with people and did they take some conversion action that we could measure, whether that was visiting a website or or watching a TV show or buying something online? And literally just trying to use that common currency of, of 
people and households and devices and to carry that all the way through rather than reduce everything to, you know, it's males 25 to 49 and they all behave the same way. And so we're going to think about them as a mass. I'm going to agree with that summary. Males 25 to 49 definitely all behave the same way. <laughs> Is that bad? Okay. That's a, yeah. All right. I'm Thank so you glad for the editorializing I'm, there. I'm so glad yeah. I'm no longer in that demo, so I don't have to. I'm gonna, neither going to deny or confirm, confirm that I'm part of the data, but the demo, but. I think we'll edit that out. Uh, I'll keep it in. It's fine. You, you do. <laughs> it's a podcast. So the, um, I do want to get back to actually smart TV data in a second, but before we get there, let, let's, let's give an overarching definition of addressable TV. What is addressable TV? I would define addressable TV as video impressions delivered on a TV set that can be targeted at the device level. And so multiple people watching potentially the same program, whether at the same time or at different times, can see different ads in that content. So it's close to the addressability of Internet, but on the Internet – or on on traditional internet devices like a, a, a desktop, a phone, a laptop, it's it's pretty much assumed it's a one to one conversation on those devices. But when you get to a television, you're still dealing with a multi- potential of a multiple viewer situation. Well, to be clear, yeah. it's potentially a one to one situation on internet connected devices, whether that's a smart TV where you're watching in an app, or whether it's your phone or your laptop. The practical reality is not all media channels are actually doing that, but those typically are technically addressable because they're delivered over the internet and there is a hard separation of content streams and advertising streams. TV, broadcast TV did not evolve that way. Ads have been baked in to the TV signal as it was sent out to all the humans via antennas and then cable. And so the methods for replacing some of those ads with ads that could be targeted and delivered in, on a close to real time basis differently across different households has been somewhat of a niche technology for the last 20 years or so. A lot of the reason for that is simply the technical hurdle of taking a medium that was designed for one way transmission and trying to make it personalizable, customizable, targetable. And I think we're finally on a path from that being a niche behavior that's constrained by the technical shape of the industry to something that in the next 10 years, 15 years, will be possible for every impression delivered to every TV device. Where that's coming from is a combination of smart TVs that are actually able to replace ads in real time directly on the TV set and an evolution of the, what was the cable ecosystem into one that is more streaming focused than broadcast focused and the advent of technologies like ATSC 3.0, which is the new standard for broadcast television that separates the content and advertising streams. So for those of you who don't know what ATSC 3 is, it stands for Advanced Television Standards Committee. It's the basic infrastructure platform that allows over-the-air signals to reach your television set and allow you to view wonderful content. And that's been updated to be able to support 4K and 8K signals. And with the, I think the framework was standardized officially about a year ago. Correct. And do we think that it, television sets that come out in 2020 will have that technology baked in, or is it a little further out still? I think it's a little further out than that. The CTA meeting where I would learn about that is not till September. Okay. But for those, just to contextualize this a little bit, for those who remember when your your big glass tube TV set turned into a flat panel about 10 years ago, this is sort of the next stage in that evolution where we've already gone to digital. We're now going from one-way digital to two-way digital in the core broadcasting platform for television. So it means the TV show can get sent to you over the air or over broadcast airwaves. The ads can get inserted over the internet, and they're designed to play nicely together so we can solve for some of these issues around addressability. So we're no longer shoehorning in new technology into old tools. That's correct. Okay. So just for fun. 
because <laughs> because 30 million television sets around 28 to 30 million sets a year according to CTA are sold in the US about 60 to 70% are smart are connected. I think it's actually higher than that. So now. even, uh, even higher. I think of current sales, it's right. actually really hard to buy a dumb TV. Exactly. So so how relevant do we think at that point? You know, if 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 most television sets are IP enabled to begin with, and we have all these new services, whether it's Disney Plus, HBO Max, you know, you have your Netflix, your Amazon Prime. How how big a, an impact do do you think ATSC three could actually have? When I mentioned this before, I sort of covered all three bases, right? It's the ATSC3 plus the move to streaming is also a big deal, plus the ad replacement on the smart TVs through regular broadcast. And honestly, I think it's kind of a race right now, and I'm not sure who wins. The thing that's interesting about ATSC3, as opposed to the other two, both of which already have momentum, is that it solves for all the other TVs as well. So once that's the standard, we're now at a point where literally every video impression is addressable, whereas in the other two cases, we're essentially waiting for whether streaming or ad replaceable cable and satellite and telco TV actually, you know, who who gets all of the marketplace first. And I think the reality is they're all likely to survive. There is political and national security interest in actually maintaining a broadcast television infrastructure, regardless of how popular streaming becomes. So I think that will, you know, ATSC3 is going to be the cleanup better. <laughs> okay, there you go. Let's bring us back to the here and now, though. And again, talking about addressable TV, and when I was at Omnicom, and we were really working with a jerry rig system. It was DirecTV, Dish, all on local avails, very, very little inventory, but it was great to trial and test. So how much further? I think at the time we had maybe a footprint. If you if you put all the unwireds together, you had a footprint of about 30 to 40 million households at that time. How how much further have we progressed to date? Where Where are we? I think if you look only at the cable telco satellite addressable footprint, it's gotten bigger, but not that much bigger. What's changed is that the availability is much more consistent. So back in the day, it was some cable boxes could do it and some couldn't. And, you know, only the DVRs on the satellites could do it, but not everybody had those. I think a lot of that has sort of percolated through the system. But the uh, trafficking, the deals and the trafficking and the measurement are all still incredibly annoying. Well, that answered my next question. <laughs> <laughs> So the scale is bigger, but the scale is not yet universal. And it's why I'm excited about initiatives like Project Or that will start to bring other inventory online as potentially addressable and about the continued efforts of companies like um, what the one-to-one team at Cadent is doing and some of the other tech providers to at least try to provide some glue across all the different cable and satellite providers. And Jonathan, describe, please, what Project OR is. Project OR is a consortium sponsored by Vizio, one of the smart TV manufacturers with a decent-sized footprint. OR stands for Open, Addressable, and Ready. And the idea there was to try to create an ecosystem across all the TV manufacturers that enables replacement of broadcast advertising with dynamically inserted advertising delivered directly from the TV set itself. And they have built enough of the technology standard to start pushing that out, looking for both other TV OEMs to participate, because I don't want to buy ads that are only delivered to Vizio TVs. I want them to also go to Samsung and Sony and Toshiba and LG and also doing it in cooperation with the broadcast networks and the cable providers who have to agree to make inventory right now that is sold nationally available on an addressable basis. So I just want to jump in one more time because you've touched on something that's a little bit more my wheelhouse, which is a question about the content and the creative. So 
while the addressable marketplace might not have grown in terms of number of households quite as much, does that mean that the infrastructure is better, it's ready, and the creative side of folks are a little bit more prepared to deal with all of the iterations or how we stitch things together? What kind of evolutions have you seen in preparation for this brave new world? It's a great question and honestly an area that's slightly outside my expertise. I think it's a a chicken and egg problem Mm -hmm. where a lot of the problems about things like dynamic creative that were originally addressed by companies like Visible World back in the day who also were the deliverers of addressable advertising, the scale hasn't changed enough and the distribution tools haven't changed enough to make it straightforward to standardize the distribution of dynamic creative across the TV ecosystem. But at least we're now at a scale and on a trajectory where that's become a problem worth solving. Mm -hmm. So I think there is much more effort in that direction coming from a combination of the bigger scale of addressable and the fact that streaming has grown up as an addressable platform. And so there already are reasons to do lots of creative versions and figure out how they work. One of our, just as an example, one of our big theatrical clients, one of the major movie studios is currently running a campaign for one of their movies that has 300 different creative variants of just their video advertising. So, you know, they get that a different version of the message to a different person at a different point in time is the right way to have a conversation with them and try to get them to come see the film. The tools for dealing with that are still a little bit cumbersome, but we're solving for it. And analyzing the data too. Right. So so does that mean that the future holds that I'll be able to put on my VR headset and watch one of 300 versions of the actual film? Is that what? You're going all bandersnatch on yeah, I, went a little, <laughs> I went a little bandersnatch there. I actually did. I think there's a, there's a very interesting, I, my, my wife is obsessed with choose your own adventure books. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, it's one of those things that has never really achieved scale because it's a different way of telling stories. But God, I hope one of my entertainment options is going to be to do that. And I also hope there will be an opportunity for beautifully crafted, singular experiences that I'm led through the story arc. Yeah. So at this point with your clients, is addressable still a test and learn? Or is it, nope, this is part of the of our media strategy? For I know, And I know it differs by clients, but, but in, in, in general terms. Well, it varies massively by clients because it's much more relevant in some product categories than others, right? So historically, for consumer packaged goods where it's a singular singular product that's sold to everybody in lots of different retail outlets, it hasn't been an area of major focus. I think we're seeing people now start to reach in there and understanding that Buying in bulk but delivering different messages to different households or doing product split within a big company where a large company like an SC Johnson that has 10 different product lines or more varies the message depending on who it's getting delivered to is, is a use case that we're starting to see more of. We're also starting to see addressable TV emerge as a way to supplement ad delivery to households that don't watch a ton of linear TV. The interesting thing that's happened as more granular television data has become available is that brands can start to look at who their linear campaigns are delivering to via regular broadcast TV at a household level and then use both addressable and digital methods to supplement that reach. So rather than saying we're going to buy... 20 more broadcast spots, we can buy addressable spots that might be five times more expensive on a CPM basis, but only deliver them to the people who haven't already been overserved. Let's so, say. so it's balancing the reach and frequency. That's right. And and I think that's been a big focus of, of what we're trying to do, actually, to bring it back with Omni, is to look at, you know, valuable impression delivery rather than just bulk and trying to help our clients avoid over frequency that we believe in research my team's done bears this out contributes to what our, our CEO Scott Hagedorn has been calling negative reach. The idea that if you overserve somebody with advertising for a particular product, you're not only wasting your money on that over delivery, but you're actually pissing people off and making them less rather than more likely to engage with your brand. 
So, Jonathan, we know that one of the barriers for cord cutting is the importance of local stations for news, for sports, to consumers. And that that has been one of the barriers. There was a company a while back called Aereo that tried to put out a solution, taking those over there signals on little micro antennas, and then allowing consumers to stream, converting that to IP, allowing consumers to stream there. The Supreme Court actually ruled that that was unconstitutional based on circumvention. And the company actually went bankrupt and went away. Flash forward to now, a company called Locast, started by an attorney called David Goodfriend, his name is David Goodfriend, has re-kind of brought that model back, but with a little twist. He thinks that this twist will allow the company to survive, and that twist is it's a not-for-profit. It asks consumers to donate, so it's not a commercial venture. And at the same time, the five networks have already filed a lawsuit against Lowcast. Do you think that Lowcast is important? Do you think it has a chance? Do you think his, that his, his argument that, you know, we consumers, the public, gave the public airwaves to the broadcast networks, in return we get to access over-the-air antenna, we get that content for free, should we put those over-the-air antennas? This is just an easier way in the digital era to be able to access that signal. Do you think that this is important to consumers? And and where do you think that Lowcast plays out? I think consumers care a lot about local TV. I have always been surprised at, especially in the digital broadcast era, how few consumers have taken advantage of the fact that they could buy a $25 antenna and probably get 40 or 50 free TV stations, and they could buy a cheap DVR and have a lot of control over that. And I think what Lowcast is doing from a technical point of view, is making that last mile bit easier. So if you're a broadcast network, why would why sue them? Why not just embrace and say, okay, more GRPs, more, you know, it's running full commercial load national, full commercial load local. Why not say, okay, if that's the way consumers want it and we can monetize it, fine, let's let them do it. So I think there are two big challenges there. One is measurement, and I don't know how you would measure low cast as part of the TV ecosystem right now, simply because we're in a quandary generally in the TV business about how to deal with measurement. But put that aside for a second. I think the other issue is one we talked about earlier, which is if low cast is controlling that last delivery mile rather than the local broadcast affiliates, and it's the affiliates actually who are the ones who made the public commitments to the airwaves, right? It's not the national networks who are affiliated with those local broadcasters. What the broadcasters are worried about is they're losing control of their ability to decide what ads get inserted there. And in a pure broadcast world, that didn't matter so much. In a world where they're trying to put in fewer, more valuable ads using the addressability tools that we talked about before, I think this actually gets in the way of that evolution. And so if I had to hypothesize about their concern, it's that they want to preserve flexibility in their future. And my guess is, honestly, there's a reasonable compromise middle ground there that doesn't result in an outright ban. Great. Agree. My last question is a question regarding this idea of being able to do addressable on a national feed. And while you've said a few times that that's sort of where we're moving towards and where we're trying to get to, if you're the networks that just had a phenomenal upfront, double-digit CPM, increases, sold out most of their inventory. In fact, what I'm hearing, and I don't know, I can't confirm or deny, but I'm hearing that Scatter is going to be incredibly tight this year, that they took most of the inventory and sold it during the upfront. So you've done done all your business in pretty much eight weeks for the year. That's right. I I remember those eight weeks. Exactly. (laughs) Well, do you? Do you remember them? (laughs) Actually, not really, but that's a whole other conversation. (laughs) But the the question is, what what is the impetus for the networks to say, all right, let me take this easy way of selling a lot of inventory and make it incredibly complicated by divvying up this national inventory into these hundreds of buckets of addressability? Well, the opportunity for networks and addressability is to – increase the value of the impressions that they're delivering by making them more targetable and more measurable. So I don't think of it as an alternative to Upfront. I think part of the motivation and and why 
they're interested in having this, you know, consortium conversation is to be able to retain that control, deliver some of that inventory as part of their upfront commitments, and either increase their revenue because people will pay more for those addressable spots, whether it's because of message rotation or or selling to multiple advertisers, and because ultimately that gives them the opportunity to sell fewer ads for the same amount of money and therefore retain a better competitive edge with streaming services. So I think if you look at the long game, it makes a lot more sense for them to be looking at national addressable platforms than just thinking about this year. Because the reality, whatever this year looks like, is that the broadcast ad avails, the just the amount of opportunity they have to sell is decreasing significantly every year. And so the reason they're raising prices is to keep revenue constant. And so on some level, it's supply and demand. But part of that is because the demand or the demand is big and the supply keeps getting smaller. So one thing that I feel like I neglected to do was to give you full props, Jonathan. I didn't really hit some of the high points of your early stage career. And this is going to inform why I want to ask this next question. So just to go back for one second, you did things like co-founded the first banner ad supported website from Wired Magazine. Yes, 25 years this, uh, this October. And I'm still a reader, by the way. You joined the launch team at CNET, which was the first integrated web TV programming venture. You worked on web-based online communities, you, uh, everything. So your early stage career was prescient already. So given that, what do you think is going to come down the pike in the next 12 months that will really wow you? A couple of the things that I'm actually excited about are that I think consumers will be able to pull back more control of their media experiences. I'm not sure what the Omnicom corporate party line on this is, but I think ultimately it's good for everybody in the advertising ecosystem and for humans in general, for people to have better ability to control their privacy, their personal data, and where they choose to engage with advertising as opposed to where they choose to jump to subscription-based non-ad supported alternatives. And I think one of the things that we've seen with the evolution of products, just like you know, Hulu with multiple levels of ad. You decide Options. how much mm-hmm. you want. Choice. Uh, CBS All Access offers that choice right now. I think you're going to see that from HBO Max when it launches. I think you'll ultimately see that from all of the different streaming services is, you know, you've got an, an expanding wealth of options that gives control back to consumers at the same time that it gives advertisers more confidence that the people who they are trying to reach through these platforms actually want to be reached that way. Mm -hmm. So I think that's actually good. Mm -hmm. A thing I would love to see and that I've been working on in my copious spare time (laughs) is to try to pull together a unified measurement framework for the media industry. And I think that's going to require a bunch of companies to collaborate on, I don't want to say pooling their data because that makes it seem like a giant honeypot, but of working together in a way to let advertisers understand how people are engaging across different Mm -hmm. platforms and advertising and publishing companies, because the alternative to that is advertisers have to keep guessing about how that's working together. And that will keep resulting in, you know, over frequency of advertising and loss of control. Mm -hmm. So again, I, I think the two sort of go hand in hand of if we can get to impression level measurement in a privacy safe environment, we also then unlock the ability for consumers to have much more control of their media experiences and advertisers to do a better job of targeting and measuring and spending their money wisely. And oh, my pundit co-worker, <laughs> Jeff, do you have thoughts for wish list or or future casting for the next 12 months? Well, like I said, I, I don't think I've seen as much innovation slash volatility, both potential benefit and potential threats to the entire industry's models. Certainly, if you bought into the fact that data is everything and data is the future, it's going to be very interesting to see where the privacy legislation nets out. 
in particular because I, I, I personally highly doubt there will be a federal privacy law before the elections. I just don't think that's there's feasible. No, there's no way. There's no way. And so that means the California law goes into effect. That means several different potential states have another year to pass privacy legislation. And that no one knows what the impact of actually being able to use third-party data. Mm -hmm. First-party data is still gold. First-party data is the clients. They can use that. But outside of that, it's going to be very interesting to see what happens in that area. Having said that, we're also at the precipice of 5G. And from my experience in looking at every single change in media consumption across the digital era, it's been predicated on a leap of bandwidth. Mm -hmm. And here we are standing in one of the biggest leap of bandwidths that we've ever seen as civilization. And so what that entails, what that means for 4K, 8K, immersive 360, well, we don't know yet what that's going to bring. And that over the next 12 to 24 months will become self-evident. And that's where I think it's – that's why I think it's a really, really interesting time. But the most important thing that I want to learn in the next few minutes uh -oh. is what's with the hair knot? What is that? Oh. Like, is it a David Carradine thing? Is it American Ninja Warrior? I don't, what's going we're talk, on? This is a podcast. So we're talking about Jonathan's <laughs> very cool look, everyone. Yes. He is the coolest guy in research. Thank you so much. I don't know that, that I can – Live up to that. But the, the short answer is my hair is actually pretty long right now. It's pretty hot outside, so it's up. <laughs> okay. And I think the pretty long as it's getting thinner in front, you know, the same way the media guys need to adapt their business models before they have a problem. I have both threats from my daughters to cut off my <laughs> long hair in my sleep and the reality that as it thins in front, I'm not fooling anybody anymore. So this may be the last time you see me this way. See what we learn on the podcast. Exactly. Insider insight right there. Thank you. <laughs> and I think that that actually concluded my last question, too, which was your biggest concern for the coming 12 months is somebody could cut off the top knot. <laughs> That, that's, okay. Yeah, it's a Samson and Delilah okay, well, thing. Jeff, right. thanks for taking us down that route. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, who fun. said numbers can't be fun? I'm E.B. Moss. I'm here with Jeff Minsky. We're at Myers BizNet Media Village, the Myers Report, and Jonathan Stoyer, the chief research officer of Omnicom. And it's been so edifying to have you here. Thank you very much. It's been a blast. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Jeff and E.B. Cool. Thank you. I'm E.B. Moss, and you've been listening to Insider Insights for Media Village. Check us out at MediaVillage.com, and I hope that you'll subscribe to Insider Insights wherever you listen to podcasts. 